really, really excited to be here. Uh, it's always uh, a pleasure to be back on campus. I think we need more opportunities to come back. Uh, but thanks a lot for the lovely introduction. And, uh, and for those of you who did not raise your hands, you have about an hour to download Pulse, because uh, I want a full, full raise of hands at the, the end of the presentation. Uh, but today, uh, so hi, I'm Ankit. Uh, I'm Akshay. We met at Stanford, uh, became really, really good friends, and, uh, and started Pulse in the last quarter of our, uh, of our studies, of our grad school uh, here. And uh, today, we're here to talk about a topic that's really, really near and dear to our hearts. Uh, all of us uh, in school, um, and when we're bored of what we're actually doing, do side projects. Um, and that's kind of a way where you know, we either do them for a grade, or we do them just to have fun. Uh, but I don't know how many of you, it was definitely not the case for, for us, stop and think about the side projects, right? Like, you know, why are you doing this? Why, what, is, what is actually the real driver? And, and how is, is this, in a way, kind of improving your life or, or helping you in the future, right? Uh, and we did that for ourselves, uh, you know, just after we launched Pulse and realized that there's a huge amount of value in doing side, side projects. Um, so today, here, here we are to talk about side projects and how uh, you know, should start taking them seriously. Um, and, and these are just some quick projects that we're going to put in front of you that uh, we have done in our last, uh, in, in the two years that we were in school. Um, and you know, we'll, tell you, we'll take you through our journey and share with you why those side projects did not work uh, and what were the learnings behind that. And how we, you know, in addition to a lot of learnings, how we used those um, and really applied that to Pulse and uh, and kind of turned it uh, turned it in an advantage uh, for us. Uh, so the first one, this is an app that uh, I worked on uh, during my summer internship between my first and second year uh, with a friend called uh, Evan Reyes, who is uh, currently the founder of Circle, uh, and it was called Buzzwid. Um, the idea was really, really simple. Uh, iPhone 3GS had just launched at that time, and the biggest change in the iPhone series was the ability to take videos. And so we were like, yeah, a lot of people will start taking videos because it's there. Uh, and what will they do with those videos, right? And so we were creating a platform where you can, get, you can see all the videos that people are taking. And the goal was, oh, it'll be on a map where uh, you'll see what's happening right now. Like people will be taking a lot of videos about uh, some celebrity sighting or some restaurant that opened up, or uh, this is where things start going downhill. Uh, <laughs> but you can see all these videos on a map, and you'll be able to spot what's happening. And the business model was that an advertiser will be able to promote their product or service that, is, that someone has taken a video about, uh, which we were hoping was you know, quite frequent. Uh, that was not the case. Um, and so this was the idea. We tried, you know, we had a lot of conversation, a lot of debate about it. It took us two months to launch. Uh, and eventually, we did that, and it failed. It, it got you know, 200 downloads in the first day, got 20 downloads in the second day, maybe like two the rest of the days that week. And then it really didn't get any downloads after that. Um, and, and the biggest learning that I had from that was you need to focus on we, we, did, we just had an idea that people will you know, use, take a lot of videos and, and want to see them on a map. Right? That was just a cool idea. We didn't actually have a solution for something that's a problem that users were facing. Um, and the big learning was that you need to focus on solutions, not ideas. All of us here are really creative. And we come up with loads of ideas throughout the day. And we, get, we become really excited about that. And say, like, dude, we should start a company around that. But that's, when you actually go to the other side, where you talk to, uh, where you, you know, find out what someone um, actually a problem, a problem that they have, and solve that, is is when uh, you know real value comes out. Um, this project was um, a class project that a couple of friends and I did in our computer vision course. Uh, it was a really really fun course. Uh, it was taught by Sebastian Thrun at that time, um, and. You know, it was, it was a regular class project that we were doing for a grade. Um, 
And at the, at the same time, I was also taking some other D school classes. And so I was really excited about, um, about you know, making it as a product, not just a, a class project. Um, and so convinced my teammates, we went and um, you know, talked to a lot of people and kind of looked at uh, what computer vision problems can we solve, right? And so we eventually got to this, this project where you can sit in front of a computer and uh, try on pairs of glasses. Uh, and so as you can see, these are not glasses, this is just a rendering. Uh, but the, the essential concept was that, say, Warby Parker has a, has a website, uh, and you can just sit there in front of your camera, and you can move your head around and, and try glasses. Uh, because you know, I, I have a pair of glasses, and it's really hard for me when I go to a store, and I take these off, and then I put on another pair, and I have to like, stare at the mirror uh, to actually see how I look in those glasses, because I can't see without my glasses. Uh, and so that was the idea at that time. Um, but again, it, was, it just got to a class project and it, and it failed uh, for a bunch of reasons, because uh, it was hard to get the technology right. It, it would have taken us a lot of time, and it was a very crowded market. But essentially, the learning there was, which we stumbled uh, upon very fortunately, was we were slowly moving from just thinking of it as a class project for a grade to an actual startup. Uh, it was almost as if, you know, we do, at least in computer science, there are uh, three to four courses that a graduate student takes, and every course has a project, uh, usually. And so when we started thinking about each of these projects as potential startups that we could launch, regardless of whether the startup actually launched or not, you went through a lot of different ideas, you met with a lot of different people, and you actually trained your mind in how to accept certain parts of an idea, how to reject certain parts of an idea, the best way to communicate that to people, and so on. So the more projects that, you, that we did as, as startups, the better we got at training ourselves to really, really do it when, when you know, we wanted to uh, afterwards. This third project um, is, uh, is actually part of a research that I was doing at Stanford. Uh, and so when I came here uh, in 2008, I had just come from India directly, and I had no scholarship or, or any kind of grant. Um, and it wasn't really exciting to think of taking that much of a loan um, and, and trying to repay that later. So the first thing I did was try to get a research position at Stanford, and I was really lucky. I uh, did this project in the radiology department, and it was a really, really cool project. It was about using image processing on scans to detect the type of breast cancer. And so without doing an actual surgery, you can just look at the scan and try to classify what kind of cancer uh, a person has. And so initially, it was a really exciting project. But you know, throughout my first year, kind of towards the end, I, I got slightly bored of the project. And the other things that I could have done with my time, like meeting new people, coming up with new ideas, or trying out new prototypes, all of those things where I wasn't able to do that. This, this project was cutting into that. But on the flip side, I was able to actually pay my tuition and be at Stanford because of this project. Um, and so it was a really mind-boggling trade-off. Like, in hindsight, it seems very simple, but it was very difficult. And I struggled with that almost towards the end of my uh, two years, uh, where in my last quarter, I decided, hey, this is not worth it. I actually want to, uh, I want to value my time. So essentially, the big learning was, time is more valuable than money. Um, and so I took all of the earnings that I had, it was about five to $6,000, and uh, spent it on tuition, food, uh, rent, and basically spent that money on, um, on that D school class that we started Pulse. Uh, and so all of my time was focused on this one course, one product, and one idea that we had. And that obviously paid out really well. Um, but essentially, the learning was like, your time is, is way more valuable than other things that people tell you are actually valuable. And that also applies when, when you do a startup, uh, where there are a million decisions you have to do. Um, you know, when we launched Pulse, there was a client ready to pay $30,000 uh, during our first month. But we decided not to pursue that, and instead carry out uh, kind of working on our roadmap. Uh, because we knew we were building something a lot more valuable. Um, so that's number three. I'll pass on to Akshay for 
to the rest. Yeah, so I wanted to kind of talk similarly on three projects I worked at Stanford, like Ankit, uh, in my two years, and I learned a lot uh, from it. So this was one of the first, the, my pro first project that I kind of thought, let's, let's take it out there. This was the, a project I did with a couple of friends in my summer between my first and second year. Um, uh, and we actually got a grant at Lightspeed uh, to basically, you know, I think we got about $30,000 to kind of build this app and actually push it out. And a simple idea we had was that uh, we, we saw a lot of people kind of, uh, at least in Stanford, like running late to meetings or um, running late or, and still driving and you want to kind of just kind of push out your phone and, you know, say I'm a few minutes late and then the text message goes. So it was a very simple app uh, that we actually built where you can actually see the contacts up there and you can kind of select like a set message and, and then just send it in like, you know, without actually typing any message. And we actually launched it. I think this app still exists and I don't know what's happening to it, but it actually taught me a lot of interesting things, which I didn't realize. Um, I think when, when I did this project, I was actually in the frame of mind where I was really thinking about starting a company, like doing a startup, being an entrepreneur. Like those things were really important to me. And then the summer when I kind of went through that, I realized that that actually adds a lot of pressure on you. Uh, you suddenly feel like, oh, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm doing this startup. And it kind of like moves you away from thinking about the core thing that you're actually working on, which is working on products. Like I think that working on product is a lot simpler, a lot easier to think about rather than thinking about, I want to do a startup, I want to be an entrepreneur. And actually during the startup, I learned a lot about um, founder dynamics. We actually had four founders. And during that summer, we actually had to fire one founder and we, we made all sorts of mistakes in terms of like how we should think about equity, how we should think about legal stuff, like how we should think about product. And actually just kind of this app that we actually spent almost 10 weeks building, you know, we didn't think any, anything about marketing. We just kind of put it on the app store and thought we would get thousands and thousands of downloads. Um, you know, that never happens. You have to really think about like, how is this going to be positioned in the market? How are you gonna market it? What are some other things you're gonna do so that people actually discover it? Um, so anyways, that summer ended and I came back to Stanford because you know this wasn't really going anywhere, but I came back with all these learnings about if I were to, you know, if I were to start a company or if I were working on a product that's taking off, it's gonna, I, I know exactly how I should think about equity uh, between my founders. I should think about how do you structure the legal stuff well so that you know, we don't have that. So a lot of that was really key learnings for this. Um, the second project that I did was actually in Rwanda. Um, it was part of the class uh, called Extreme Affordability at Stanford. It's offered at the design school. Um, and it was really fascinating because I, I did my undergrad in electrical engineering and also my master's in electrical engineering where we kind of sit in a class and where we, you know, we get problems, we spend a lot of time in labs, we kind of like talk to some peers, we kind of solve problems in, on paper and give it to them. I remember my first project at D school was uh, to redesign how people eat ramen noodles. And I was like, these guys must be kidding. Like redesigning ramen noodles? Like it's fine the way it is. And they, they pushed us to go out there and observe people eating ramen noodles. Uh, and they pushed us to kind of go to markets and see what people kind of buy. And I found that really, really like awkward at the first time. Like I remember I was at Maruichi in Mountain View and I was just kind of like staring at people eating ramen noodles. <laughs> and, and I was like, they must be thinking I'm, I'm some sort of a, a freak doing that. And I was thankfully with another couple of people who, who started talking about, oh, you know, that person, like the water is kind of, you know, coming out of the bowl. Uh, or oh, that person is kind of eating while he's walking. And you start seeing people like doing things that they do, but there are problems with the way they're doing it. Um, and so when we when we did the when I did the extreme course, we were trying to essentially improve nutrition for Rwanda and thinking about how are we going to actually uh, improve the nutrition in the country where a lot of people actually die because they don't have enough nutrition. And it's one thing to think about okay, well we want to try nutrition, so we have these ten ideas. But there's another thing where you actually go out there and you spend ten days. And so actually sitting with with these people, like we spent ten days in Rwanda on the ground, really understanding you know how they live, what they eat, you know, what is their daily process, what are the things they actually do, and how does 
our solution fit into their daily lives so that we're not actually trying for a huge behavioral change. Um, and this was a huge learning for me because, you know, this is a project I was doing alongside courses like uh, machine learning and courses like artificial intelligence where we don't get this experience. But I think in this case, just getting that knowledge, you know, really understanding how people live is very important for actually building your next, you know, building your products because you really need to know how people currently live and what people currently do and what problems they have before you go out there and actually build something for them. And then it kind of started to come all together in some ways where um, this is a project Ankit and I actually did uh, with a friend Albert in the data visualization class where uh, this was an idea that, you know, we, a lot of people wanted to kind of visualize their lives in, in, in kind of a timeline. And this was actually, we actually used the Facebook API and built this timeline two years before they introduced their timeline. So if you actually like rotate this 90 degrees, like it's the Facebook timeline. <laughs> uh, but we actually built this in our class and, and this, was, this was where it started to come together where we actually talked to a lot of people uh, who used Facebook on campus or in cafes in Palo Alto and started talking to them in terms of how they would want to visualize their lives. And we, we built this in, in a couple of weeks, really fast, you know, rapid prototyping, um, where all your Facebook data was put on a timeline. You could kind of browse uh, down there over the last two years. You could actually search for a person and see what kind of interactions you've had with them. It was just a neat tool that actually was appreciated by a lot of people who were in the class and who actually got to see this. Um, it was also the time where I start, started to feel like all the classes that I'd taken at D school, which taught me um, going out there, speaking to people, getting insights from them, um, and then tying it back to the knowledge we get from computer science and electrical engineering courses in terms of actually building tools, started to come together, where we were starting to do both of them together. Um, and in this case, like, you know, just kind of being able to build something quickly. Like, I think this was a key learning for me before coming to Stanford, I had, you know, I had a lot of ideas in my head, but I didn't do anything about it. Um, and I, I realized one thing is that your, your, I think your head can only take, only keep so many ideas. And so if you want to actually bring new, more new ideas to yourself, you actually need to do something about your current idea so that either it works and you go for it, or it doesn't work and it's out of your head so that you have space for new ideas to come in. Um, and I actually really believe that. I think like you can't, you know, otherwise you're just kind of, you have five ideas and you think all of them are like a billion dollar ideas, but you're not doing anything about it. But actually like even spending two weeks, four weeks, or even a day like prototyping something and realizing whether this has some wheels or not is, is key to figure, you know, kind of continuing to iterate. And so like these, you know, these are three of my projects. Ankit talked to, you know, three of his projects. These six projects actually like, you know, taught us a lot of interesting things in Stanford just in these two years, just through class projects. And we, we learned a lot about finding need, like what do people really want? We found a lot about, you know, what's the value of time at this stage when we're in our early 20s? Um, like, is this more valuable than actually like spending time on other things that we're less passionate about? Um, I, you know, we learned a lot about founder dynamics, like how important it is to keep it simple, to have good kind of transparent feedback for each other. Ankit and I have worked for, you know, we, over four years, but we worked for Pulse over the last three years, and it's been really, really important for us to, like, when I have a problem, to just call Ankit for lunch and tell him that, hey, like, you know, you know what you did here was not right. I, I didn't like that. You know, in the future, let's make sure we're always in sync. Or for him to tell me that, you know, it would be nice if you could hear me out a little bit more. I think, like, just the dynamics is extremely important because at the end of the day, you know, you, what you're building as a startup, it's, it's, it's all about people. And the people really need to click, need to work together and collaborate. So for me to actually make some of those mistakes in the first summer actually was hugely important um, for, for, for when we actually built Pulse. And then kind of goes to go on with like, you know, a lot of, we still go out uh, every Friday and talk to a lot of people, understand how are they reading news today? Like, what are you doing? What kind of sources are you reading? Where are you reading it? Um, how many times in the day do you read news? All of those actually help us figure out what are the products we're gonna build. Um, and so all of that actually led to the last quarter at Stanford where we actually built Pulse, 
uh, which I was really pleased that about half the room kind of knew about it. But we built this as, uh, you know, all those learnings came together. We built the first version of Pulse again in a d-school class in five weeks. Um, it was an iPad app. We built it in five weeks, put it on the App Store, uh, and it kind of took off in a big way. Uh, and, and so the last three years, we've been really focused on kind of expanding that vision, expanding the product. Uh, and today actually having an app that's you know, used by over 30 million people um, has been you know, kind of a culmination of all of these learnings that we've had o over, over the two years we were at Stanford. Um, to a point where now we're actually employees of LinkedIn because LinkedIn bought us uh, about two weeks ago for, 30 mil uh, for $90 million. Um, and so I think for, for a lot of that, I think we, people can say that, or you know, sometimes we can think of it as like, oh, you know, they came up with this idea for, in five weeks, they put it on the App Store, and then just, this kind of just became you know, this, this huge success. Uh, but actually, it was, there was a lot of small pieces at Stanford that actually made it possible. Small things we learned in, in, these, in these side projects. Um, and the more side projects you do, the more mistakes you make, the more learning you have. And you never know when that side project is going to become a big company. Uh, but if you stay focused on actually building products, if you stay focused on actually just kind of putting things out there, seeing how people use it, seeing if there's something interesting, you might actually be sitting on something that's you know, the next big product that, that may make it out there. Um, so, so we wanted to kind of keep that short, uh, um, kind of talk to you about like, some of the things we've learned, but uh, you know, really open it up to questions you guys have. Um, we were here just over three years ago listening to people and we thought that you know, one of the things I, I realized was like, I wanted to ask more questions and kind of you know, think about things or ask questions, particular things that you, know, you don't hear otherwise. And so Ankit and I are very happy to be very transparent about all the things we did at Stanford, good or bad, uh, that really helped us actually build Pulse um, to where it is today. So that's open up to any questions you guys have. Yeah. Go for it. So what were some of the things that, well, how did you learn what was working and what wasn't working quickly? Yeah, so I can talk a little bit about what we did with Pulse. Um, so with Pulse, it was, it was um, because it was built in five weeks, um, it was very bare bones. Um, I did the visual design as an electrical engineer, so you can imagine how bad it was initially. <laughs> um, and so... <laughs> Yeah, was, I, I, I'm glad we're, we're not sharing those mocks anywhere. But it was, it was actually pretty bad. And we were not sure if it, it was ready for prime time. And so what we did was we, we actually thought, let's target a smaller demographic first. So what we did was we actually, uh, my good friend Joel had this really cool camera. And we said, can we just shoot a film of about a minute, which basically goes through the app and shows what it can do. And, and so we, we, we shot this at Satura Cakes in Palo Alto. Actually, it's not there anymore. But we shot it there, um, and we put this video in a bunch of design blogs out there. Um, so we put it in Core 77, not caught, not the tech blogs. We put it more in the design blogs just to see people's reactions to it. And more design blogs picked up that video. And so already we, we saw a lot of people actually uh, curious about this app. So even before we had actually launched it on the App Store, people were actually talking about it people found the interaction to be really neat. And, and so, so that was the first thing. And then we actually launched it without actually press to just see how real people use it. And we actually saw the app actually shoot up to the top of the news category. But there was a lot of feedback. Like the visual design was really bad. People wanted more sources they wanted to add. People wanted a better catalog. And so we spent another two weeks actually refining the product to those feedback points. Um, and that getting that feedback quickly was really important for us. And then when we felt comfortable, we actually sat down with a visual designer for a full day who basically like, took out all my designs and actually made it much cleaner, uh, like you see in these mocks. Um, and then we actually did a smart thing. We actually made another video. But in this video, we actually focused on sources that we wanted, us to, co wanted to cover us. Or like, so we focused on, like we, we had TechCrunch in there. We had New York Times in there. We had a bunch of sources there um, in Pulse being used. And then we actually emailed TechCrunch and said, see, TechCrunch is featured in this video. Uh, we emailed New York Times and said, you're featured in this video. 
Um, this is a new product that Stanford students have built, like you guys may want to cover us. Um, <laughs> simple, simple, and then, and then they picked up that video, so TechCrunch actually wrote about it. Um, they wrote about it, and then we actually shot to the top of the App Store uh, overall, not just the news category, and then news, New York Times picked up, because they said, well, there's a class project that's suddenly in the top of the App Store. And so we were, that was, that was you know, the first week when we actually got you know, more mainstream press. But we were actually ready at that time to be able to kind of accommodate you know, a much bigger use, user base as well. Could you please tell me a little bit about uh, the team and how it uh, expanded and what you learned during that process? Being yeah. such a rapid success. Yeah, I think uh, that's actually one of the big benefits of being at Stanford. Uh, a lot of the people that you meet here eventually become part of your startup family. Uh, like the very first engineer that we hired, so I, Akshay uh, was more on the design side I did the original iOS apps, and so the very first engineer we hired was Albert, and the three of us did the, uh, the last project that you saw together, and Albert did the, the Android app. And then slowly we built out a team where we hired uh, Greg, who was our lead backend engineer, uh, who had worked with Akshay before. Um, On we, the previous startup, like the Zaptext one, I actually worked with him, so I actually pulled him back <laughs> into a more successful one. Yeah, and then we hired uh, Christina, who, who I think you TA'd, yeah. Uh, in one of the courses, and through a lot of like friend TA network, uh, we we got a lot of our early hires. Uh, yeah, actually, first seven eight people were all from Stanford, because um, we at that time we ha we hadn't raised a lot of money. Uh, we actually were not making a whole lot, and so those were Stanford people are the crazy people who actually believe in you and like believe in your hope and actually join you, um, and and so we kind of got people who we were we had worked before or who are friends that they kind of joined us and actually, and we got to a point where we actually raised our seed round, which is about a million dollars, uh, which allowed us to actually move into a real office um, and then kind of slowly built it up. I think our hiring so far, I think we've, we've tried to stay small. Uh, we were about 25 people when LinkedIn acquired us. Um, so it's you know still tiny compared to the traffic we had, but we our hiring strategy was more about uh, actually hiring people after you feel the pinch rather than really having the foresight that we may have this pain in the future, so. In year 25, uh, how many women? I think we had about seven or eight people, seven or eight women in the company. Uh, we and still do. Founder Dynamics, how might the dynamics have been different? <laughs> I wouldn't know. I haven't started a company. Yeah, but, you have, but you have women who you've interacted with. So I think like... Um, hey, could you repeat the question? Sure, yeah. I, so, I asked, um, how might it have been different if one of their co-founders was female? The question is, how would the dynamics be different if one of our co-founders was, uh, was, uh, was female? I think like for us, like Ankit and I have actually f uh, tried very hard to actually keep a balance. Uh, in the company and actually having women be part of the team. And the, the reason is actually, there's a lot of good reasons for it. Uh, but I think there's a lot of things that, I think that, uh, that a woman can think that a man wouldn't think necessarily. And especially for Pulse, actually, we're, we're trying to build a product which actually use, is used by mainstream people. It's not built for just males who are using, you know, just reading about tech or other things. It's actually built for anybody who wants to read about you know, content. And so actually having that DNA in the company where you know, Christina, who's our first hire, uh, to tell us like, hey, like, you know, it's good we have tech sources, but we also need to have fashion and lifestyle, and we also need to have other things that people would read. Um, and, and so having that balance is really good. The other thing that was really good for, from an internal culture perspective is that actually just people in general are much more well-behaved if they're like, you know, if it's not just like 10 dudes like in a company. Men are well behaved. <laughs> yeah, mostly men are well behaved, I guess. <laughs> uh, so actually internal culture was, uh, was hugely benefited. And, and it really helped us to hire more, more female employees. So we actually had uh, Jean who was our first, uh, our second Android engineer. Uh, and it was really hard to see any other startups have female engineers in their teams, which is great. 
So after the LinkedIn acquisition, um, what are the what are the sacrifices, if any, that you've had to make, and what are kind of the core values of Pulse and the team dynamic that you hold near and dear and have to maintain in post transition? So today was my official third day at LinkedIn, so I'm still figuring out some of those things. Uh, but I'll tell you this. So Pulse actually had a lot of content, a lot of users, uh, but we were trying to get identity, which is basically like, you know, who are these people reading? What's their background? Um, and LinkedIn on the other side has identity. It has over 220 million users. They know where they're working and they're trying to get into content. So it's a very complementary uh, kind of fit for both, both teams. And LinkedIn has been really, really good in terms of keeping us, uh, keeping the same culture that we have. So we all sit together at LinkedIn. Uh, we're still driving the Pulse app, uh, but suddenly we find ourselves actually having a lot more resources uh, in terms of, you know, they have some among the best machine learning uh, teams in the Valley. Um, they have incredible mobile products. Um, and so just being able to tap into them, like I think has been so far amazing, uh, but we'll find out more as we kind of, you know, fully integrate with them. Have you thought consciously, consciously about your culture? I mean, how would you characterize your culture? Yeah, I can, I can take it, you should add more. But I think culture is actually one of the most important things um, that I think every founder should think about. Um, and the, the interesting thing is like the culture changes, you know, very fast. Like with two people, like adding another person can change it a fair bit. And so culture could be very different for four people versus 10 people versus 20 people. And so you have to, as from a founder perspective, you have to always be changing processes to make sure that Everybody gets that. Uh, for us, actually, we, we borrowed, we stole a lot of ideas from dSchool uh, and put it into Pulse. And so there are no cubes, like it's open floor. Everybody has access to everyone. It's a very transparent company. Um, there are post-its all around so you can, every person should be thinking about product. It's not just like us or the product manager. Like even if you're a back-end engineer, you should be thinking about product a lot. Um, There's whiteboard walls. Uh, so you can just write anywhere. Any any space can become a discussion space because you never know who you're gonna run into and what what uh, serendipitous ideas kind of come out. On Fridays we have uh, a session at the end of Friday to wrap up the week. Uh, we have a session which we call "I Like, I Wish, I Wonder," which is again stolen from the D school. But I think at D school what they used to do is at the end of the class they used to um, you could sit down for ten minutes and give feedback to your professor. You could say like oh, I like how you did this, or I wish this was taught in a different way. Um, and so we stole that and we made it our debrief uh, internally, which we still do today, uh, every Friday, every week. Yeah. And so people get together in a big circle at Pulse, 25 people. So we started when we were five, uh, but even at 25 we do this, uh, where we gather around in a circle and everybody gets a chance to say anything on their mind. The only requirement is the, the sentence should start with, I like something, I wish something, or I wonder something. Um, and so they could say like, you know, I wish Akshay spoke less, or <laughs> I like Ankit's dressing sense, or I wonder, you know, what, what's gonna happen to Pulse at LinkedIn. So it's a very open culture that way. I wonder how you monetize Pulse. <laughs> Great question. Um, so I think for monetization, uh, uh, we're, it might change depending because of the LinkedIn acquisition, but I think at the core, we're really excited about uh, content marketing. Uh, and in very simple terms, content marketing is essentially allowing brands to be publishers, to be able to write their content. Um, and so, you know, Red Bull does this really well where they have they, they sponsor a lot of events, they write a lot of interesting content that people read. And so our, our core belief is that advertising should not be annoying. It shouldn't feel like advertising, it shouldn't feel like the banners you see on the web. It should feel like content. It, sh it, it should feel like something you wanna actually engage in. And, and Pulse is all about content. And so I think our monetization plan is to essentially, uh, just like you can read different publishers, like brands will be able to have a voice inside Pulse as well. Go for it. Can you, do you have any wisdom or advice about fundraising and like how you got funds to, especially during the initial parts of your, um, of the startup? So the question was if there's any wisdom around fundraising. You um, can start. 
I can, yeah, uh, the best wisdom is that hopefully you don't have to think about it. Um, we didn't have to think about it. So essentially we stayed focused on product and we got lucky in a couple of different ways. Um, first was, I think Ankit and I built Pulse and we said, okay, we're gonna push this out for free. Um, that was the first thing that I think most people think like, oh yeah, it's the Valley, push things for free, get lots of users. But uh, we had a professor, Michael Deering, who said, why are you giving such a beautiful product for free? And I think we were thinking, well, <laughs> this looks really ugly. Nobody's gonna buy this. Uh, but he said, no, you know, I think you should ask people. So we actually went out to cafes and asked them, you know, how much would they actually pay for it? We got people actually saying that they would actually pay three to five dollars. So the first version of Pulse actually had a four dollar price tag, um, which was awesome because suddenly we, I think in the first six months we sold about a quarter million uh, of these copies. So that was our first million dollars where we did not have to actually ask investors for money. Um, and then we had enough traction and we were ready to kind of expand beyond that, where investors were actually asking us uh, whether they could invest. And so it's a very enviable position. And I think we got a lot, we got really lucky, we got really fortunate with Pulse. Uh, but in general, I think um, we can talk offline in terms of exact dynamics that you should think about if you are going out fundraising, uh, in terms of what are some of the things that work, uh, do not work. but. If you stay focused on product, hopefully like people will notice that. And in today's world, actually, you don't need that much money to start things, uh, unless you're actually building satellites, uh, which I don't know, a couple weeks ago, somebody spoke about that. But I think with a lot of consumer startups, you don't need that much money. So I think start something out there, push it out there, see if that has wheels before you actually really think about you know, raising money. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I would add to that was, uh... It was, it was very good when we did fundraising because Akshay was more focused on that, whereas I was still focused on the product. And usually it's the case that when you are fundraising, your product suffers. Uh, and if you let that happen, then it impacts your fundraising negatively also. Uh, so it's always very important to keep the product going however you can uh, while you're in fundraising. Perfect. Did you consider bootstrapping all the way? We did, we did. So we had, we, so we sold about a quarter uh, million um, of these apps. So it was, you know, we had a few hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Um, and we got to a point where we could continue doing that. And that would, you know, that would have hopefully like sold more and we would have made. But I think we got to a point where um, a lot of the ideas in our heads was actually built around the fact that, you know, not just you, but your friends, your family, all of you will be reading news on Pulse and your experience will get even better when, when, when all your people you're connected with also read news on Pulse. Uh, and, and we got to a point also personally where we decided that, you know, we kind of wanted, we, we had bigger dreams. We just didn't want to have like a million dollar uh, that we split a few, you know, with three, four people and kind of run with that. Although there's nothing wrong with that, but I think personally we, we wanted to kind of really kind of shoot for the fences with Pulse, especially because this was the, first company that Ankit and I are you know, seriously working for or started. And so, so we decided to kind of you know, take, the, take the leap uh, and actually do that. Uh, but, but I think, I mean, I think we could have actually stayed bootstrapped and you know, that could have been an interesting kind of trajectory for Pulse as well. Go for it. Being here. So obviously one of the a lot of the traditional uh, content publishers and media companies are fa facing a lot of challenges in terms of monetizing their content or having to switch to new monetization channels. Um, what are some of the interesting or exciting ways you think content publisher or content delivery platforms like Pulse can help with that beyond just helping them reach like a broader or more targeted readership? So the question was like, what's the value proposition for publishers to be on Pulse? Some of the exciting ways you think you can help them in terms of uh, finding, yeah. So monetization, I think for publishers, I think, um, so, you know, there's two value propositions for them. One is obviously getting readership, the other is making money. Um, and for making money, I think there are two bets we've made with, uh, and, and I think they've been pretty interesting. So I think we did not have a background in journalism or publishing, and so we kind of came in really rethinking how advertising looks and rethinking how commerce looks for, for these content publishers. 
Um, I've talked a little bit about advertising, which is I think we think content marketing is the future, which is essentially, you know, stop thinking of ads as banners and something that destroy the user experience. Really think of ads as content that people want to read about. Uh, so that's one piece. The other piece that we've thought about is commerce, which is essentially uh, we launched a partnership with Wall Street Journal where you could actually buy the best articles of today uh, from Wall Street Journal for $1 a month. Um, and that was actually one of the most innovative partnerships. Actually, the only time Wall Street Journal has actually uh, done a different partnership beyond their own model. And we actually got convinced them to actually do it for $1 a month. And the idea there was uh, very simple, which was basically, if you get a brand new iPhone, um, you know, you, you download a bunch of free apps because it's easy to, you know, install. Um, but th there comes a time when you actually, like, actually put in your credit card details and get that $1 app. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. But once you buy that $1 app, then, like, you're buying $5 apps and $20 apps, and you're just kind of, like, spending a lot on the platform. And we thought, like, we could take that idea and bring it to the publishing world where, you know, if, in Wall Street Journal today, the first, if you want to actually buy something, that would be about $45 a month or $30, $35 a month. That's a huge price point for people who actually get free content, you know, convincing them to actually pay $35 a month is a lot. And so we thought, well, maybe we can prime them so that people can actually buy something for $1 a month, and those people would actually be great customers who could actually buy full subscriptions also. Um, so we're in that strategy. We're still figuring out how that kind of plays out for us, but, you know, that's, that's the other thing we've kind of experimented with. That uh, you had some problems at the start, and perhaps you moved too quick with equity and uh, the fire founder. Do you have any recommendations or suggestions for other I'll say a few, but I think like there's there's a lot of I think the cool thing about now is there's a lot of information online, um, and so I think you should definitely read every line of uh, you know venture hacks because it has everything in terms of details of how these are structured. Um, I think the other advice I would say, um, particularly with founders, is actually, I, I actually think, one is extremely hard, like just actually being a single founder. Um, I don't even know how a single founder does it because there's so much stress on a daily basis. Um, two is actually, for me, has been ideal. Like just working with Ankit has been really fun because there's been times when like I've been really, really like you know hit low uh, in terms of like all the things that went wrong today, and Ankit's like in a medium, and so we kind of like balance each other. And then there's been times that Ankit's kind of hit low, and I'm doing okay because maybe the sales are okay. And so I think two has been really good for us in terms of just kind of balancing each other's energy. Um, I think beyond two, I think three is probably still okay, but I think four is too many. Um, and so actually like keeping your founders to maybe two, ideally, or three is, is, is good because then I think, you know, you have a couple of brains to think about, uh, you know, someone to argue something. If, you, if you're only founder, it might not have enough people to kind of really bounce ideas off of. But with four, actually, um, we were thinking about like our personal issues more than we were thinking about ideas uh, about the startup, right? I think there were, I think it was just too many cooks in the kitchen at that point. Yeah, and the founder culture becomes really important, right? That, that actually creates the company culture in some sense. And that's why being very transparent with each other, being, giving open feedback, being constructive about each other's ideas, kind of all of that uh, happens very smoothly when you're two people. But when you're three or, or more, it just, it just breaks down because there's too many connections happening. Yeah, I think like open feedback is really key. I think like Ankit and I started that in the first two months when we were working alone. And actually like in the company, everybody can give feedback. We have an internal form called AAAAA, which is essentially like ask Akshay and Ankit anonymously, which is this, <laughs> which is this like simple anonymous Google form, which anybody in the company can ask random questions to us. Like, I don't know, like, why are the toilets not working? And then, what happens in board meetings. Or what happens in board meetings. And Ankit and I have to answer that every Friday. So every Friday, before we do I Like I Wish I Wonder, we actually go through all the questions people have asked. Um, and everybody has access to this doc, so they can see all the questions that other people are asking. Um, and then I think that open feedback loop is really, really important, because uh, I think one of the ways I think about it 
is that you know these like small tremors like are good for the earth like you don't want kind of the pressure to build and have a massive earthquake right like you want this kind of you want the pressure to be released every now and then so that you don't actually have a kind of a big outlash against anyone the negotiation experience with the publisher in order to get their article for one dollar per month. Since I am building a startup and I'm going to negotiate with the vendors and I don't know where to start, you know, yeah. Yeah, so it's, the question is like how do you kind of negotiate with publishers or vendors? It's really hard, like it's, 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 um, so we tried it when we were really small and like nobody like paid attention to us. Um, and so we just dropped it. We decided we're not gonna even bother talking to publishers. And so the first year and a half actually we did not talk to publishers. We just focused on getting, uh, you know, there's a lot of enough kind of public RSS feeds out there, kind of public content out there. And so we decided we're not gonna talk to publishers. We're just gonna like try to build an audience first and see if people, if we can convince enough people to actually download Pulse and use the content. Uh, and actually read the content here. When we got to about you know a couple million users, like three, four million users, um, publishers started reaching out to us and they said, I actually wanna be part of Pulse because I wanna actually expand my audience. Um, and so we just kind of did that for a while until we actually raised our Series A and then we actually built a team which does more outreach and actually gets more publishers. But actually if you can actually create a scenario, sorry this is a non-answer, but if you can create a scenario where um, they need you more than you need them, um, then you're, you're kind of in a good position. And Which is usually when you focus on the product. Yeah. Right? Like it all comes back to what is your mission, what are your values, and what is your product actually doing? And it's possible. Like I think for us at least, I don't know what your business is, but for us, like we kind of had to hack around a lot of different things to make that possible. Um, but you know, I think from their perspective also you can think that for a publisher, they might be getting pitched you know, a thousand ideas every day and so they can't really talk to a thousand companies, but when they see a company that's really kind of growing, then they have to talk to them, right? So. Okay, but just a little bit more curious. So how could you acquire the first content? So, so most, of the, most of the content, I mean, are copyright, right? So there's a lot of public content, public feeds available. Okay. Um, so a lot of tech blogs, a lot of small blogs are available freely that you can use. Um, so we kind of like, you know, did whatever we could with the content we had available before. And now we have partnerships with over 750 publishers, but initially we did not focus on that that much. We just focused on building a great product that people could use to read. Did you face any legal problems while you were founding? Uh, problems related to incorporation and all these uh, being international. I get laughs because I think uh, we got sued by New York Times and I think very early on. So, uh. Yeah, I think related to visa stuff, we were lucky. We were students. We were on a student visa. Uh, we put the company on E-Verify so we could actually work for another 15 months after, like 29 months or something. Uh, so that was, that was easy if you're starting off as a student. Uh, and I think the biggest advice, like you should definitely incorporate your company and, uh, and get, get all that going as soon as you, uh, as soon as you can. Uh, because that really helps you if you wanna start monetizing and you're on a, for, uh, on a student visa, you, know, you can start doing that. Uh, or it also lends kind of a legitimacy to what I'm doing and, and prevents gonna, you from giving up. I'm just gonna add a disclaimer there. You should talk to like immigration lawyers and tax lawyers. Uh, do not true. take our word for it, but I think it's possible. Uh, we can connect you with some people. Yeah. <laughs> but actually on the legal side, we did have a, a really fascinating day in June. I think we were still in school. Um, so this was after the New York Times actually wrote about us and uh, that was more on the editorial side. And so, but I think uh, this was Monday, I think it was sometime in June, early June. Um, it was the WWDC conference and Steve Jobs was going to actually uh, to, uh, release the iPhone 4, uh, which is a huge improvement. Um, and then before he actually launched the iPhone 4, he, uh, 
he talked about five or six apps that he loves. Um, and uh, we had no idea. Apple doesn't tell you anything until you actually see it. And so I was watching this in the dorm here. And Ankit was actually in New York. Um, and so he's like, oh, let me show you some iPad apps that I like. And there we were. We were the first, you know, Pulse was the first app that he talked about. And I was just like, did that really happen? <laughs> Why am I dreaming here? But anyway, so this is like 10 AM Monday morning. I'm kind of going berserk. This is probably like the highest high. Uh, it's probably like the you know, happiest I've ever been. Um, come like maybe five hours later, 3, three o'clock, 3.30 to be precise, um, Ankit and I get an email from Apple saying that um, you know, New York Times has complained and we've taken your app out of the store five hours later. So, so when, you, they, when they talk about a roller coaster, you know, the entrepreneur's life being a roller coaster, that happened in five hours. Um, I think a lot of things happened and then we were back into the store next, the next day morning. Uh, but that was, that was one of the craziest Mondays I've ever had. <laughs> We've ever had. Go for it. So you raised a very interesting, interesting question about luck, uh, that you guys were lucky. So in your opinion, what would you honestly say was luck versus something that you learned, like skill, from all the experiences that you had? Something very specific, luck versus skill. I think we may have different views, so maybe, yeah. maybe both of us can actually talk. Uh, well, I think, I, I mean, luck is very ambiguous, because uh, to me, a lot of what luck is, is just your subconscious algorithms that you develop, uh, which could be skills that you might know or might not know of. Uh, but throughout a lot of these side projects, or throughout um, kind of just thinking through things deeply, there's a lot of things that you develop that uh, you base your decisions upon. And that's intuition, or that's gut, or whatever. And that makes you feel lucky because you chose this based on very little data and was like, oh, I was lucky I came to Stanford, um, that kind of thing. Or I was lucky I took this D school class that, that launched Pulse. Um, but, but there's obviously, that's not all of it. I think there's, there's real, real luck, uh, which could be you know, meeting Akshay in the first, first week of school. Um, or just like a lot of. Uh, yeah, there, there are those moments, um, or I don't know, being, being mentioned by Steve Jobs, I guess. Um. Yeah, I think like it's, I think a lot, of, a lot I, I actually attribute a lot of Pulse to like good timing, um, good luck, I think. Uh, but I think actually you can create that for you. Like I think it's, I, I think of it as more like, you know, you're at a bar and there's like, you can play darts and you just kind of keep throwing darts. Like sometimes you'll hit the bullseye. Um, and, <laughs> So I actually think you can create that. But if you don't play darts, like I don't know if you'll ever hit the bullseye. Yeah. Uh, but actually with Pulse, there was a lot of good timing. Like iPad had just come out, and we were one of the early news apps. Um, we were written about in New York Times. And so we were on the top of the app store. And that was probably the time that Steve Jobs was probably thinking about like what are, what are the apps that I want to actually talk about. And so just being on the top of the app store just that day before he actually talks about it was, I don't know, it's probably godsend. Um, well, there was that interesting anecdote with, uh, was that newspaper app? Uh, yeah, there was also early like editions. A, there was also a competitor back then, um, whom we, I think there was a small company, and I think we were both fighting to like stay ahead of each other in news category. And uh, <clears throat> I think we both pushed our app updates at the same time. I think we got approved, and then I think the other developer, um, I guess, sick. got delayed or felt sick or something. And then that was like just a day difference where I think Pulse got picked up, and then it was you know on the top of the store. But I think a lot of things have happened. Like I think we were lucky uh, to be out on Android first when Amazon actually picked us as one of the apps they wanted to put on their Kindle Fire. Uh, it was just like being at the right place at the right time. Like you can't really like hope for that, but I think you can try different things and hopefully like some things work out. But I think, you know, I think we've tried really hard, but I think it would be false to say that, you know, everything is because of our hard work. I think a lot of it was good timing. Uh, a lot of it was luck. A lot of it was uh, kind of meant to be. Thanks. Thanks. One more question. 
Could you describe a little bit more about your launch strategy and how you got to be noticed? I know you guys talked a little bit about posting on design blogs, but how were you guys um, approaching trying to get noticed by people and when did you really realize that catching on? So the question is about how we, uh, what is our strategy to get noticed? Yes. Um, I think the, the strategy is actually actually evolving every day. Uh, it started with posting videos on, on design blogs, but I don't think we can honestly say that we have it down and, and we know what the strategy is. Um, I think one thing I can definitely say, and we can add to that, is uh, we, we realized very early on that you need to be, A, you need to be very focused on your product because your product speaks much more than, than any kind of press that you get or, or any other uh, publicity that you get. And, and B, you need to be able to have the right focus for that product. And so who is the user? What is the need that you're solving with that product? And what does, how does that product help someone's life? And so when I am a passionate user of Pulse and I go to my friend, how do I, tell, how do I convince them to download Pulse and, and, and set it up right then? What do I say? And all of that comes from the, the founders and the team being very focused on this one thing that, that we're trying to solve. Uh, and that basically drives itself. Uh, well, that's, that's the current working hypothesis. I think the other, I guess like one thing I read recently that I've, I liked a lot was essentially, don't think of it as a launch. Like I think like we have this idea in our heads that we are you know, working on this thing for months or weeks and we're gonna have a launch. But if you like take that stress away from you, you're just gonna push it out, see how people are using. Like even if you have 100 people really engaged uh, and using it, um, one of the things we did in, in Pulse and totally through luck, but you know, it wasn't planned. But when we first pushed out, our, uh, pushed out the app live on App Store, the first version of the app actually had this heart sign on the top right. Uh, we, we, you know, that heart sign was, you know, people thought, well, maybe you like the app or maybe you do that. When you click on that heart uh, sign on the app, it would open up this inbox, uh, kind of a composed mailbox, composed mail uh, directed to us uh, with the subject feedback for Pulse. And people, all they needed to do was had to type something in. And so even if people kind of like by mistake clicked on that, they sent us some interesting feedback. And like a lot of people may actually send you like, oh, this app is good or oh, this app sucks or something like that. But some, you know, one out of 10 mails was actually like people doing work for you. They would be like, you know, this visual design is really bad. You should try this color. And we were like, holy shit, people are actually telling us what color we should use here. Or like people actually telling us, hey, I really want to read this, this, and this. And remember the, for the first four or five weeks, Ankit and I actually painfully read every email, responded to every email, got into a discussion. There was that one really big email from a neuroscientist who actually told us that the design we have is so good that a brain can really visualize a lot of content. This is the most efficient design for the brain to kind of actually like skim through content. And we were like, yeah, we exactly thought about that. <laughs> 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 but I think like the key is like, you know, even if you have only 100 people, but they're really engaged, um, then you can actually get to a point where hopefully you are actually tracking data and you can actually look at analytics and you can actually figure out like, hey, this is why people are so engaged. And this, if we do this, we may be able to get a bunch of other people also engaged. But try to remove that stress of being launched because I think we can tell you our numbers. Like when people write about you in TechCrunch or New York Times or other things, you're gonna see a spike, no question about it. You're gonna see 10 times, 20 times, 100 times more downloads than anybody else. But those downloads, let's say if I got a thousand dollars every day and because I was in TechCrunch, we got like 50,000 downloads, those 50,000 downloads are not people who will most likely be using your app three months from now. They were the people who kind of read about it, downloaded it, and probably like deleted the app. But I think the people who are gonna actually use, about it, use your product are people who actually discover it uh, and actually liked it and actually told their friends about it. You know, those are the people who will stick with their product. Those are the people who will actually make, you, make your product and make your company a lot more successful rather than the people who kind of just read about it in TechCrunch today, downloaded it, and then threw it. So try to remove that launch stress away. Just push things out there, see what people say, kind of build on top of that. 
Do we have, Do time we have more time? Yeah. Well, we will invite everybody to come uh, talk to them afterwards and ask questions. But on behalf of SDVP, Drupal Fisher Jervitson, Stanford Bases, and all of us here at Stanford today, thank you, Uncle Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.